So it is a common idea in the world that everyone wants to be happy. And so it is easy to approach the Buddha's teaching with the wish, may this make me happy. But what people might overlook is that the desire to be happy can easily become an activity or dependent upon activity. I do this, which is then in a positive sense going to make me happy. Um, but those activities in their very nature depend on all sorts of other things that are typically not in your control. So the Buddhist teaching is actually not so much about becoming happy, but about being free from suffering. But what's the difference? Anyone? Well, one difference might be that if I'm looking for happiness, I will actively constantly looking for something outside of what is present now. Mm. Instead of like if I'm looking to put an end to suffering, I start with what I have, meaning I'm suffering. That's why I'm looking for happiness because I'm suffering right now. So if I start to try to put an end to suffering, I will look for what I got right now, what kind of activity I'm doing that make the suffering possible. And then I will try to stop doing that. Instead of trying to add something on top of this suffering, I try to stop it right there. So the very wish to be happy is actually born from suffering, you are saying? Well, if someone looks for happiness, it's because he's not, he's not happy, so uh -huh. he's suffering in a way. So rather than positively doing something in order to become happy, one can also ask the question, what is it that is presently making, <coughs> making me unhappy? And then looking into the origin of that. But that obviously is going to be unpleasant because one now has to come to terms with the fact that one is not happy. And with the fact that the things that are making you unhappy are precisely the things that you don't want to give up. The things that make you unhappy are the things that you do not want to give up. Ironically, no. Yeah, so people, <laughs> so th that means that people are confused about what is actually yeah. in their welfare and making them happy. Yes. So what are the things then that one would ordinarily assume make one happy, but that according to the Dhamma are actually making one suffer? Well, I was, yeah, I was going to give the course example of the, the triad, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Hmm. But yeah, those kind of coarser things that go against the precepts are kind of the first thing that one needs to kind of question if they want to go in this direction. Mm -hmm. So actually, observing eight precepts would be bringing about the right kind of happiness. Immediately. Immediately, you're saying? No, no, I'm asking. I'm <laughs> oh. asking a rhetorical uh -huh. question. <laughs> yeah, oh, I see. Because, uh -huh. again, if you're approaching the, the, the whole question of how can I be happy as quickly as possible, mm. would the eight precepts be the answer? No, because otherwise everybody would be pursuing just that. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. So, but then the question might arise, um, so why is it that those things that... Um, that you think are happiness, why is it that they're suffering, actually? And what is the difference between the right kind of happiness and the happiness that you get from those things? Because you, you factually get some sort of happiness. Mm. As the Buddha said, um, it's not that there isn't any gratification in sensuality. Mm -hmm. Because if that were not the case, nobody would be... If that were the case, nobody would be pursuing it. Mm -hmm. Like, it would be just obvious to any anyone that this is not worth it. But yeah. it's not like that. Mm -hmm. So it does give... A factual sort of uh, satisfaction but what is the difference between that satisfaction and the happiness that you would get from the Dhamma which as the Buddha said Nibbana is the highest happiness yeah so what was the difference between those two hmm. so the first one is um, drawing one's attention away from 
the nature of one's experience or, or <coughs> the common thread of all, all experience um, and is yeah, investing one in that which is dangerous or that which is mm. subject to change. What, what if you still don't see that taking taking yourself away from the nature of the experience is suffering is there a more acute reason or, or more acute difference in the nature of uh, like in and of itself what that happiness is the wrong happiness and the right happiness well the wrong happiness depends on things in the world such as uh, things that your senses present, for example. More acutely. Content of experience. <laughs> more acutely. Ready? No, more acutely. <laughs> more acutely still, huh? Yeah. Safety. More. Well, more um, specifically. <laughs> like not being bothered. No, the wrong happiness. Well, like not being bothered just like as a circumstance. And that's like you mean ignorance, basically. Like, and how would you call that? Just in the in what what would be the simplest label that you could give to that? Delusion, no. or greed, <laughs> pleasant feeling. Oh, mm. I see. Pleasant so, feeling. the wrong type of happiness, because you might say, um, obviously, as you said, there's a course level mm. where you're actively pursuing uh, stuff like in the world, and that that's abandoned through the eight precepts, like, but. It, it's not that someone who gives that up already got the right type of happiness because, mm -hmm. for example, you can be keeping the eight precepts and still be engaging in concentration practices that mm -hmm. give you the wrong type of happiness. Mm -hmm. So it's not the, like things in the world in that core sense. Uh -huh. It's the fact that it depends on a pleasant feeling being there. That's mm -hmm. the main problem with that type of happiness. Like it's based on what you're feeling. Uh-huh. Whereas the the right type of happiness is is there regardless of what you're feeling. So that's why you wouldn't really call it happiness. I mean, in a, a kind of colloquial sense, you could use that expression. But the difference is that uh, it's not it's about not being bothered on a different level. Not like circumstantially pleasant feeling arose. Mm -hmm. But it's even when the most unpleasant feeling arises, you're still not bothered. Uh -huh. So that's why the, when the suttas would say, um, the liberated mind, whatever feeling it feels, it feels it detached. Mm -hmm. Whether it's pleasant, painful, or neutral. So it doesn't say that it only feels pleasant feeling. And mm -hmm. that's the, the main distinction. Like um, an ordinary person, all they know in order to the only way they have to be at peace even if they're not seeking external pleasures is to have pleasant feeling enduring hmm. if painful feeling is enduring they cannot be at ease and uh, no, on the contrary this is when they will be seeking pleasant feeling yeah, in any right. way yeah. it doesn't matter if like they can be seeking pleasant feeling through what they think the dhamma is hmm. and and that's still wrong like because it's still if it depends on circumstance, if it depends on things that are impermanent, such uh -huh. as feeling, uh -huh. it's not the Dhamma then. Mm -hmm. So, um, more acutely, it's it's uh, the right happiness is not depending on feeling anymore. Because, uh -huh. as we already clarified in that discussion uh, about the nature, uh, the difference between feeling, sensations, and emotions. Mm -hmm. um, like when you think feelings are just sensations or something, it's it's quite um, the problem is is watered down to mm -hmm. a great degree. But if you understand, feeling is like feeling is that uh, that pressure, that thing, that existential um, burden. drive mm -hmm. or burden, mm -hmm. and you recognize that you're subject to that no matter what, and you can't get rid of it. And you realize now that you need to find a way to be at ease, even while that bur burden is there. Mm 
Like mm-hmm. as Sariputta said, all feelings are suffering in and of themselves. And the Buddha gave this simile of um, for the nutriment of contact or pressure. He said it's like a cow that wherever it, it would lean on, it yeah. would be bitten by uh, gnats and flies and stuff. Mm-hmm. And he says in the same way, it's like we're attacked by pressure, attacked mm-hmm. by... And, right. and then he said, whoever understands that, they understand the three feelings. Mm. So it's that existential bur- existential burden that you can't get rid of. It's not just a sensation that comes and you sort of uh-huh. do this and that and get rid of it. It's like your entire being is enclosed within it. And then the right happiness would be where instead of like replacing it with something else, mm-hmm. you understand first and foremost understanding that you're subject to this and you don't have a say in it well that already would if you really understand it that would already seriously diminish the burden because as the buddha said the burden is craving hmm. it's the fact that you know yes. contrary to the fact that it's obviously not in your control hmm. like you've been doing every single you're from the day you were born and before you've been doing everything you could to get rid of it and yet not once have you succeed succeeded for any um, like prolonged period of time. Um, in spite of that, you still no. This time it will work. This time I'll get it, mm-hmm. and it never does. So, just understanding that this is not in your control, rightly, is already uh, diminishing the burden while the feeling is there. Mm. So that's the. The thing, it's like most of the time for people um, finding peace is more like, well, I've been eating this really bitter food and now I just find this, you know, sweet, creamy ice cream. Mm -hmm. And that's the pleasant feeling that people get from, you know, their meditation and stuff. Like Mm -hmm. just replacing the Mm -hmm. other stuff that they would have. But it's not really um, making them imperturbable so that even when unpleasant feeling arises they won't be bothered Mm -hmm. it's like i'll be at peace only for as long as this pleasant feeling endures Uh and that's why it's still suffering because you have to maintain it yeah that's the difficulty the ordinary conception of happiness is dependent bound up with doing things that need to be maintained yeah and And as you as you said just now it depends on the world Mm. but uh yes sure but there's we have to remember that the Buddha also defined the world as in a more acute manner, mm-hmm. which is the five aggregates. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or well, six sense bases. Yeah. So you, if 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 it depends on the five aggregates, it obviously depends on the world already. Like, you know, car, family, house, and stuff. Uh-huh. That is also within the five aggregates. Yes. So that is the world, really. Mm-hmm. So if your happiness depends on pleasant feeling, mm-hmm. in and of itself. That's really like the root of the the, the issue. As the Sutta said, that a pleasant feeling is a dart, a painful feeling is a deadly arrow. Pleasant feeling is uh, should be seen as painful. Yeah. Uh, unpleasant feeling should be seen as a dart. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, neutral feeling is as impermanent. So yeah, you should see the pleasant feeling in and of itself, not as something, not as something you find safety in. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter how pleasant it is even if it comes from something that seems seemingly not external, Mm -hmm. if it's coming from your meditation, for example, you should still see it as something something that you shouldn't rest on. Because to the extent that you find safety in pleasant feeling, you are, for that very reason, making yourself unsafe. The only true type of safety or uh, ease is when your mind has been developed to the point that even if that feeling were to go next second, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. That pleasant feeling. Mm-hmm. And then even if the unpleasant feeling were to last for two million years, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. That's the right type of ease. And again, we're talking about feelings here, not sensations. So uh-huh. it's that existential burden. Mm-hmm. So you realize it's quite a task to develop yourself to the point where that thing, which is almost automatically um, the most personal kind of... Uh, deeply felt uh, thing is not a burden anymore while it's there Hmm. like all of the all of the time or 99% of the time the approach towards it would be 
how do I kind of decrease the weight of this mm -hmm. so that it doesn't make me suffer? But that's again management. You yeah. want to see the full weight of feeling, the full weight of sickness, aging, and death, as we were discussing. It's not that that goes. Like, um, there's actually the sutta where Ananda was, uh, I think he was uh, bathing with the Buddha or something in the, in the, in the river. And then he noticed that uh, he mentioned that the Buddha's skin was already getting wrinkly and, mm -hmm. and old. And uh, the Buddha exclaimed the verse saying, like, you know, you wretched, wicked, aging, damn you, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like, look at how you make this body, you know, uh, that used to be strong and, and healthy, how, mm -hmm. it, how it deteriorates. So it means like he still recognized that existential significance of that burden, mm -hmm. displeasure of being subject to aging. But his mind was totally unaffected by it. That's mm -hmm. the right level of happiness, mm -hmm. basically. Whereas, like, a, a person might think, like, oh, right, happiness, ah, well, whatever, I don't care about this. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, that's replacing. That's more like there was ple uh, unpleasant feeling and you replace it with something else by, oh, no, this is, this is just, a, you know, this doesn't exist or something. Like, as we were saying, denying the significance of things. Yes. Like, this body is just a pile of atoms or something. And mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if it ages or not. Mm -hmm. Meaning, that's really like a... Uh, under the hood approach of you replacing the feeling that was there in order to find ease. yes and all of that happens because the, the the dominant feeling is unpleasant yeah so it's a response to it really mm -hmm. and so so in that sense the right happiness would come from once you have been enduring the right type of suffering long enough that mm -hmm. we discussed before Suffering that's there on its own, not that you were seeking it by practicing self mortification, mm -hmm. but that you simply stopped the cover up. Mm -hmm. So, like, you stopped engaging in the cover up strategies that, that you used to have. Um, that suffering that arises once you endure it long enough so that your mind basically um, comes down from that natural tendency to want to outrun it at any price. At, at any at, like whatever, whichever way it can uh -huh. um, then the task is to understand it to mm -hmm. see as as you said to learn how to see the arising of that feeling in and of itself mm. whether it's pleasant unpleasant neutral as a unsafe like a hot coal that you don't want to touch like you have no say in it being there mm. but uh you realize that if you grab it, either to get rid of it when it's unpleasant or to, you know, hold on to it when it's pleasant, that's why you suffer. Yeah, because then you are basically taking up that feeling and regarding it as yours. Yeah, and, and then if the unpleasant feeling lasts for too long, that's going to be a problem. Mm. If the pleasant feeling doesn't last long enough or goes away, that's going to be a problem. That's also going to be a problem. Yeah. So... That's why you don't want even even the most seemingly harmless feeling of, you know, you've been keeping your precepts, you've been sense-restrained, and that neutral feeling arises, let's say, mm. as, as the suttas would say. Well, it says even that you should see as not worth leaning on. You should see it as impermanent. As in, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and this is how one comes to see, in fact, impermanence. Yeah. In regards to those feelings, not, not again, like uh, random sensations, secondary things that don't carry any existential mm -hmm. meaning, mm -hmm. but with feeling, that, that is that, uh, as the Buddha said, it's the converging point of your whole existence. Yeah. It's like the, the um, yeah, it's, it's what the Dhamma centers around, really. Yeah, the Buddha taught the Dhamma to those who feel, yeah. he said, and also he said those who fully understand feeling. That's basically the definition of an arahat. Yeah, and then not not like those who don't feel anything anymore or something. Because, like, you know, there's this idea as well, I think we discussed it before, like bare perception or something. Uh -huh. And then really what, what you're saying is, I will be happy by replacing all these feelings with a blank nothingness and then that's uh -huh. how... But th see, that's all of that is just um, not really seeing... That mm -hmm. the craving was the root of the issue, not yeah. what you were feeling. Although there is that sutta where Sariputta describes 
that is his conversation with Sariputta and then he does say like how was happy let it go um, like um, like it's a question about Nibbana and then he says nothing is felt there mm. but that is seen actually as pleasurable yeah but that is then frequently yeah. misconstrued in the sense like I shouldn't feel anything yeah. no but it's actually those feelings are still there but one dwells detached from it so yeah. in that sense there's no longer feeling yeah so you could say um, without getting too abstract like yeah uh, being disconnected from feelings <coughs> obviously like it's not like Nibbana is something outside of your aggregates or something no it's still if it's if you say it's pleasant it has to be a pleasant feeling mm. it's not, not going to be something else but um, it's not on the same level where you're replacing stuff no that's the difference mm-hmm. so you you achieve it by being able to fully endure the the, the burden mm-hmm. of what's what's actually there not what you think should be there based mm-hmm. on your preconceived notions and um, that's why you know the precepts and stuff are just not optional because that puts you in touch with that suffering that you're supposed to understand mm. whereas if you're not keeping that you can think all you want about not managing feelings and enduring feelings on the right level but your actions are already the ways that you're you know yeah you're in vain th- trying to run away from yeah that's much further down the so stream. so yeah. basically if you don't keep the eight precepts you don't know what feeling is mm. like accurately you're not able to feel properly because as soon as you feel you you do something to get rid of it mm-hmm. that's that's what actions that break the eight precepts automatically do they mm-hmm. they allow you a little sort of back door when you can outrun feelings that arise and you don't get to see them for what they are so that's that's why it's so important to to not do those things because then um you know all the dhamma practice you do you just won't be regardless of it you won't be able to understand that uh those feelings were not the issue Mm. because if you were truly developing the understanding that it's the craving that's the issue why would you go ahead and still give in yeah you wouldn't so Mm. it's a contradiction maybe we can just like i I hear many times like people say like yeah but i i I sit i focus on my breath and then i calm my mind and then Mm -hmm. then i can contemplate the nature of feeling and things mm. like that and how like this practice actually instead of making one able to see his mind actually lead him away from mm. that recognition of seeing his mind yeah so the thing is um you can the contemplation of uh you people could say i'm contemplating my feelings but the thing is there's obviously various various layers to feeling. So you can grab like secondary feelings that don't actually matter. For example, um, when you're doing breath observation, you can watch your feelings on the level of how your breath makes you feel or something. And uh, you can be contemplating on that very specific level, like how when I'm breathing, you know, if I breathe, breathe this way, I feel like that. If I breathe that way, it feels like that. And then that's how I'm supposedly contemplating feelings. But I assure you, nobody is like, you know, doing breath contemplation. And then suddenly that takes them all the way back to question like, you know, sickness, aging and death. It just doesn't because you can't focus yourself in that direction and then still keep sight of that stuff. So you might be contemplating feeling, but on a level that doesn't really matter. Like, you know, the super particular present moments sort of stuff. But the background of your entire existence, that you could die at any moment, that you don't have control over this body, that, you know, everything you do fundamentally in this life won't really amount to anything because you will die anyway. You won't be contemplating those feelings. Because in order to be focused, like, going in that direction would actually destroy the calmness that you have. Because it's based on ignoring those things. So... If that's one actually one um, criteria that you could use for something that's most likely the right type of peace is like you can really go in this direction of contemplating death, aging, things that people of meditation is usually not based on, and 
it would actually increase the happiness and the the peace not like destroy it because you know usually people like thinking about the future is too much like during the meditation you get stopped thinking focus on the present moments only so now imagine like you start thinking about you know your fam family members dying or something this sort of contemplation that's going to destroy the, the happiness that you have but if it's the right type of peace it will actually um, disconnect you from feelings even more it will place you in that uh, independence of feeling which is real uh, happiness or safety you could say so could you say that to, like the people who are because I, I hear this a lot as well people yeah saying like oh I'm calming my mind but mm -hmm. it's it's not actually their mind that they're calming it's things that they're trying to calm yeah there it, it's things that they're secondary to their mind that they're actually calming and then like mm -hmm. the dog is being the wild dog the an analogy that i always mm -hmm. use if just you put the wild dog in a special room that is only the things that will not provoke it when you take it out of that room it's going to be exactly the same condition mm -hmm. as it was before so it's just like managing manipulating and interfering with your feelings with these very specific feelings so that you don't have to cope with the broader picture of what your life is, what you're subject to, um, the danger of just being born, the fact that you could die. Uh, like, it's never too late, to, uh, too early to die, basically. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, if your calmness... Because, see, see, that's a funny thing, like, even in the... In the uh, like people are aware sometimes of these contemplations of death and uh, and uh, sickness and the, the corpse contemplations and stuff but how do they do it <laughs> they take it as an object hmm. like a like a nimitta image magical image that you focus on in your mind mm -hmm. and you just keep and the whole significance and burden of you being subject to death yeah. of your possessions that are going to be lost of your loved ones that you will never see again all that is totally just taken off the picture yeah. and now it's just this object of a dead corpse that i keep repeating mm. or, or you know focusing on as a, as a quasi mantra mm -hmm. and uh that's why then it could give rise to that same again wrong kind of peace mm. but if it's that right contemplation of death where you're truly acknowledging while you're acknowledging the size of your attachments and the pleasures that you that you uh, cherish mm. at the same time you're countering it with the liability to abrupt and immediate destruction and then if that gives rise to peace that's that independence from feeling that's, that that, that is, is actually yeah. like you you do you you know like there's no doubt mm -hmm. that if you um there's, there's nothing beyond that then yeah. this could still disturb you yeah exactly yeah. and also that's how your attachments come into sight in the first place yeah right so you want to have that other direction and attempt basically this is then yoni show like yeah uh, like attempt from the origin that is where hindrances and attachment in the other direction come to be seen mm -hmm. and that is the direction which is experientially gonna be like mm -hmm. death because in that direction is is there is there anything that you can take up and regard as yours mm -hmm. funda fundamentally yeah, and, and um, that's that's really the difference. Um, you can say <clears throat> the contemplation can either go in the direction of seeking peace by ignoring your liability to suffering, which mm. is that inauthenticity that we discussed before, and all sensual pleasures. Yeah, partake of that. You you get you can get peace by essentially by forgetting like uh, ignorance is bliss as they say uh -huh. you can go in that direction or you can um, become properly aware of that liability to suffering not just by thinking about it but by factually abandoning the actions that uh, are based and, and fully centered around covering up that liability mm. and then when you expose yourself to it long enough allow it to endure don't uh, distract yourself from it and try to get rid of it by impulse then your contemplation takes you in the direction of uh, 
understanding that, that liability. Mm-hmm. And then that's a completely different thing because you didn't try to take a shortcut. You didn't try to... Um, like, it's actually the aggregate of feeling that you understand. Mm. It's not now some secondary thing. Yeah. Like, you know, it's it's kind of like... Um, you could say it's almost like a... How do you call those? Uh, when you make... Um, like a model of a city before they actually build it. The maquettes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Like a little little sort of thing that's supposed to be a representation of the real thing, but actually it's not. Uh-huh. That's kind of like the feelings that people are contemplating during their meditation. It's uh-huh. like a representation supposedly of the bigger thing, but it's it's not actually. Uh-huh. <laughs> like the bigger stuff, you entered your practice by ignoring it. Mm-hmm. So that's the difference even mm. if it looks to you like yeah this is the actual city it's not yeah and for those people who might already be established in some sort of practice or, or other one way to find out if they're doing is right is to stop doing that not the precepts but yeah. but their methods and techniques and then see if that disturbs the mind if it does yeah. you know for a fact that what you think the practice is is actually uh, creating this artificial piece on the level of a yeah, maquette yeah. in front of you as you yeah, just yeah. described it yeah and it's um the thing is that i don't know why like people don't realize this is already a problem like the fact that um i have to keep maintaining this yeah that's it yeah that, that should be obvious enough like you know it's if 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 it's already going away if i stop doing it for a few weeks then what's going to happen when you get sick and die yeah (laughs) so but there is this kind of magical view that if i keep doing it long enough eventually at some point there's going to be this click where it's never going to go away but the thing is if you're developing the right type of peace even like not all the way to enlightenment just um, uh, some amount of taming of the mind Mm. on a kind of virtue on a kind of sense restraint and uh, watching your intentions and not giving into them that's something that uh, would endure uh, basically for as long as you don't go and break the precepts so nothing else you would need to be done Mm. to maintain that sort of happiness so it does have a it is much less um, palpable in the beginning maybe but it does have a much more um, lasting nature even if it's not full on like even without the Buddha, you know, like there, there were these um, ascetics before the Buddha who, mm. who would also develop samadhi and stuff, which you could say is the right, already in the nature of the right type of happiness, mm. not concentration, but mm. uh, basically immovability of the mind. And then um, that's already, that would, they would already have that ability to uh, be at ease without having to constantly engage in two hours of something Ah, every day Uh, because it's it's basically depending on you not engaging with those things that disturb the mind rather than having to do things in order to make your mind peaceful not not doing things that distract you from your liability to suffering would sustain that peace Mm. because it is basically the liability to suffering is the reason for you being at peace mm-hmm. that's the counterintuitive nature of the liability to suffering is the reason why you would draw at peace yeah if that suffering has been understood correctly yeah. and you're not craving for or against it yeah so the liability to suffering reminds you if you have understood it rightly mm. reminds you of the liberation from it which is the same as saying that all the four noble truths they basically it's one thing like yeah there cannot be the noble truth of suffering without at the same time knowing its origin yeah exactly and its cessation so if you know this is suffering rule really mm. you are already experiencing the liberation from it yeah because because without being liberated from it you would not be able to see the totality of what is yeah suffering. exactly exactly so it's it's mutually sustaining mm. the liberation and the recognition of what suffering is so again that's very different from saying that you get rid of it or something mm-hmm. it's still there but the fact that you understand it means that it can't like craving can only exist when there is ignorance mm-hmm. 
and ignorance is not some magical uh, energy. It's not understanding feelings, you could say, not understanding their extent, not understanding their magnitude, not being able to see them for what they are while they endure. That's the that's what ignorance is, and just that you don't need to then decide or, or have some like accident where oh crap then I was ignorant and then something else happened and then I started craving against it no the presence of ignorance is the presence of craving hmm. immediately hmm. so not knowing feed not knowing feelings means craving hmm. immediately so at the same time the opposite applies knowing feelings knowing their impermanence knowing that all of them are suffering even if they're pleasant hmm. That at the same time means there's no room for craving there. Mm. So that should be your standard. How do I know whether I have been cultivating the true freedom from craving? Well, is it enough when uh, feeling is there, no matter its kind? I didn't manage it. I didn't try to get rid of it. Is it enough for me just to know the nature of that feeling in order to be completely unaffected by it without Mm. having to go through some secondary emotions? That's how you would know whether you're getting closer to it or not. And with the, going back a little bit on what you were saying, like when you say, if someone really recognizes this is suffering, he experienced the, already the liberation from it. Yeah. I think that's the difficulty because I can say, yeah, all of that is impermanence, this is suffering, but actually, if I don't experience the liberation from it, it's because yep. like, I don't see it for what it is exactly. really so it's very easy like to fool him to want to fool himself over that because yeah yeah like if someone really recognizes something i mean if someone for example is smoking and he really sees that is very unbeneficial from it mm-hmm. he, he give it up right away yeah. you don't yeah. have to wait some like medicine or some i don't yeah, know yeah, doing yeah. some sport or something around it in order to understand that but that's very yeah i think there is like quite I would say quite some. It is very easy to to see to to think like oh I understand this is suffering but yeah, actually yeah. not. The thing is yeah so that's one of the um, that's why there's this idea of oh I recognize the suffering and then I have to let go of it. But the thing is that's that's already uh, on the level of management. Uh, if like what for you in, in that context letting go would mean. How do I replace this? Even if you call it uh, contemplation, even if you call it Dhamma, it's still replacement. It's still management. So the right recognition of this is suffering, if it's done on the right level, it should be immediately give rise to anatta, to this is not mine, to letting go, to disappropriation. It shouldn't take like an extra step like you should see it on the level of I can't semi simultaneously know this is suffering and keep holding on to it if if it feels like that then that's that recognition of this is suffering is insufficient and it's um, most of the time that would be that recognition of this is suffering would just be on the level of this is unpleasant it wouldn't be the recognition of that extends even to pleasant feeling for example that's that much more fundamental recognition of uh, unsafety. Even if it's pleasant, it's unsafe because as soon as you touch it, like by accepting it, you accept everything that it could become later. By accepting it, you accept the pain that it could become later. And if you recognize it in that way, you don't have to then let go of it. Like that recognition is the letting go of it. That's why the Buddha said, if you see the first noble truth, whoever sees the first noble truth sees all the other three. Whoever sees the second noble truth sees all the other three. Whoever sees the third sees all the other three, and so on. So, um, yeah, it's just not... Uh, the general problem is is underestimating the depth of what those truths actually are and thinking it's like something we already know or something. Like when you... Would, you would think, um, oh yeah, we already know what suffering is or something, but not really, mm. not according to this, at least.
So, um, is there anything that could, um, is there anything that could undermine that right type of happiness? Is there anything <clears throat> that can undermine that right kind of happiness? Well, no, that's precisely why it's right. But if we're talking about, um, let's say, samadhi, which would also cons be considered one of the right types of happiness, uh -huh. is there anything that could undermine that? Oh, uh -huh. Breaking the precepts, or I mean, I, don't, I guess on the level of samadhi, it would be it could be things more subtle than that, giving into the mental intentions, yeah. just yeah, kind of taking that pressure that you're already sort of withdrawn from, and kind of letting yourself be pressured by it. Your habits, like giving into the habits of. So the reason why I'm saying that is because then. You know, there's there would usually be the assumption that, okay, you get the right type of happiness through your absorption practice, and then there are like things in the world that can disturb it. Like you know, there's too much noise around or something, uh -huh. and then that disturbs you and, and brings you back. Mm. But even with that uh, joy of uh, samadhi, which is not permanent, mm -hmm. it's a temporary liberation, as is to say. Well, even that is much more permanent from a certain point of view that, that the the joy of uh, meditation techniques that people would get because it's uh, it's also the reason why it leads to full understanding inevitably is because it's also not on the level of just a feeling that comes up. Mm. Even that is already an understanding of feelings. That's why there is that uh, verse in the Dhammapada it says there is no jhana for one who doesn't have understanding and there is no understanding for one who doesn't have jhana mm -hmm. so like this whole idea that samatha is just or samadhi is like this um, you can have samatha just by doing these exercises mm -hmm. and, and mantras without any discernment and then that's like a separate thing from vipassana that's completely <coughs> not yeah. supported by the sutta so even the pleasure of, of samadhi it would depend on you already being independent of feelings to a great degree. Hmm. And that's why if someone has experienced that pleasure, that right type of pleasure, they basically have already developed their minds even beyond what's necessary for becoming a Sotapatna, for stream hmm. entry. Because a Sotapatna wouldn't have jhanas. Yeah, Sotapati doesn't, strictly speaking, depend on no. there being any jhana. And, and many sutras would describe how a Sotapatna would be striving to get the jhanas hmm. before that. So um, that's why if you get that right piece and you're not a Sotapanna, then it's not the right piece. Uh -huh. uh, because um, it has to lead in that direction. Like if you were already able to make yourself independent of feelings to the point when you, where you entered the first jhana, hmm. you basically already, if you already knew the Buddhist teaching, you, you basically like already understood the, the whole point of of the, of the mind development mm -hmm. you already understood how to disconnect yourself from feelings how to see the um, uh, yeah that somebody then would not be a sotapanna that's quite inconceivable yeah yeah obviously if you haven't heard about craving well the f and, and so on well the let's say peace that would be there you would still to some extent have a notion of this is mine mm -hmm. Uh, but which, you, which was then the case when the Buddha was learning yeah. material and immaterial yeah, yeah. attainments, but now with the Buddha's teaching being present, yeah. that's highly unlikely. Like if just, I mean, the vast majority of people who have put enough effort to have a consistent meditation practice or Dhamma practice to the point where they would even think that they go jhana, whether it is the actual jhana or not, uh -huh. there's no way that they didn't get enough information about the Dhamma. Mm -hmm. So that if it were the actual jhana, they wouldn't have seen the principle of uh, feelings mm. and how to be independent of them. Mm -hmm. So that's why that, that right type of pleasure 
as the Buddha said, it should be cultivated. It should be sought after because it's not, even that is already not uh, just something that comes up, mm-hmm. like circumstantially. That's why it can't happen accidentally. It's entirely based on uh, understanding the uh, nature of your experience on a certain level, mm-hmm. not all the way to Four Noble Truths, but let's say 99% of the way. Yeah, sign of the mind. Yeah, 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 sign of the mind, exactly. So, so, And what is the mind? Feeling and perception. Mm. So if you haven't been able to see that liability to suffering that we're talking about, and you're still just preoccupied with covering it up, it's impossible that you would be able to get jhana, because that already um, requires you to, to be able to feel mm. and be unmoved by mm-hmm. what you feel fundamentally. Yeah.